This is Chapter Fifty Eight of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter Fifty Eight. For a few months, I enjoyed what to me was an entirely new phase of existence: a butterfly idleness, nothing to do, nobody to be responsible to, and untroubled with financial uneasiness. I fell in love with the most cordial and sociable city in the Union. After the sagebrush and alkali deserts of Washoe, San Francisco was paradise to me. I lived at the best hotel, exhibited my clothes in the most conspicuous places, infested the opera, and learned to seem enraptured with music, which oftener afflicted my ignorant ear than enchanted it, if I had had the vulgar honesty to confess it. However, I suppose I was not greatly worse than the most of my countrymen in that. I had longed to be a butterfly, and I was one at last. I attended private parties in sumptuous evening dress, simpered and aired my graces like a born beau, and polkered and shottished with a step peculiar to myself and the kangaroo. In a word, I kept the due state of a man worth a hundred thousand dollars, prospectively and likely to reach absolute affluence when that silver mine sale should be ultimately achieved in the East. I spent money with a free hand, and meantime watched the stock sales with an interested eye, and looked to see what might happen in Nevada. Something very important happened. The property holders of Nevada voted against the state constitution, but the folks who had nothing to lose were in the majority, and carried the measure over their heads. But, after all, it did not immediately look like a disaster, though unquestionably it was one. I hesitated, calculated the chances, and then concluded not to sell. Stocks went on rising, speculation went mad. Bankers, merchants, lawyers, doctors, mechanics, laborers, even the very washerwomen and servant-girls, were putting up their earnings on silver stocks, and every sun that rose in the morning went down on paupers enriched and rich men beggared. What a gambling carnival it was! Gould and Curry soared to six thousand three hundred dollars a foot, and then, all of a sudden, out went the bottom, and everything and everybody went to ruin and destruction. The wreck was complete. The bubble scarcely left a microscopic moisture behind it. I was an early beggar, and a thorough one. My hoarded stocks were not worth the paper they were printed on. I threw them all away. I, the cheerful idiot, that had been squandering money like water, and thought myself beyond the reach of misfortune, had not now as much as fifty dollars when I gathered together my various debts and paid them. I removed from the hotel to a very private boarding-house. I took a reporter's berth and went to work. I was not entirely broken in spirit, for I was building confidently on the sale of the silver mine in the East. But I could not hear from Dan. My letters miscarried or were not answered. One day I did not feel vigorous, and remained away from the office. The next day I went down toward noon, as usual, and found a note on my desk, which had been there twenty-four hours. It was signed, Marshall, the Virginia reporter, and contained a request that I should call at the hotel and see him and a friend or two that night, as they would sail for the East in the morning. A postscript added that their errand was a big mining speculation. I was hardly ever so sick in my life. I abused myself for leaving Virginia, and entrusting to another man a matter I ought to have attended to myself. I abused myself for remaining away from the office on the one day of all the year that I should have been there. And thus, berating myself, I trotted a mile to the steamer wharf, and arrived just in time to be late. The ship was in the stream, and under way. I comforted myself with the thought that maybe the speculation would amount to nothing, poor comfort at best, and then went back to my slavery, resolved to put up with my thirty-five dollars a week, and forget all about it. A month afterward I enjoyed my first earthquake. It was one which was long called the Great Earthquake, and is doubtless so distinguished till this day. It was just after noon, on a bright October day. I was coming down Third Street, the only objects in motion anywhere in sight in that thickly built and populous quarter were a man in a buggy behind me, and a street-car wending slowly up the cross-street. Otherwise all was solitude and a Sabbath stillness. 
As I turned the corner around a frame house, there was a great rattle and jar, and it occurred to me that here was an item. No doubt a fight in that house. Before I could turn and seek the door, there came a really terrific shock. The ground seemed to roll under me in waves, interrupted by a violent joggling up and down, and there was a heavy grinding noise, as of brick houses rubbing together. I fell up against the frame house and hurt my elbow. I knew what it was now and from mere repertorial instinct, nothing else, I took out my watch and noted the time of day. At that moment a third and still severer shock came, and as I reeled about on the pavement trying to keep my footing, I saw a sight. The entire front of a tall four-story brick building in Third Street sprung outward like a door and fell sprawling across the street, raising a dust like a great volume of smoke. And here came the buggy, overboard went the man and in less time than I can tell it the vehicle was distributed in small fragments along three hundred yards of the street. One could have fancied that somebody had fired a charge of chair-rounds and rags down the thoroughfare. The street-car had stopped, the horses were rearing and plunging, the passengers were pouring out at both ends, and one fat man had crashed halfway through a glass window on one side of the car, got wedged fast, and was squirming and screaming like an impaled madman. Every door of every house, as far as the eye could reach, was vomiting a stream of human beings, and almost before one could execute a wink and begin another, there was a massed multitude of people stretching in endless procession down every street my position commanded. Never was solemn solitude turned into teeming life quicker. Of the wonders wrought by the great earthquake, these were all that came under my eye, but the tricks it did elsewhere and far and wide over the town, made toothsome gossip for nine days. The destruction of property was trifling. The injury to it was widespread and somewhat serious. The curiosities of the earthquake were simply endless. Gentlemen and ladies who were sick, or were taking a siesta, or had dissipated till a late hour, and were making up lost sleep, thronged into the public streets in all sorts of queer apparel, and some without any at all. One woman, who had been washing a naked child, ran down the street holding it by the ankles as if it were a dressed turkey. Prominent citizens, who were supposed to keep the Sabbath strictly, rushed out of saloons in their shirt-sleeves with billiard cues in their hands. Dozens of men with necks swathed in napkins rushed from barber-shops, lathered to the eyes, or with one cheek clean-shaved and the other still bearing a hairy stubble. Horses broke from stables, and a frightened dog rushed up a short attic ladder and out on to a roof, and when his scare was over, had not the nerve to go down again the same way he had gone up. A prominent editor flew downstairs in the principal hotel, with nothing on but one brief undergarment, met a chambermaid, and exclaimed, "'Oh, what shall I do? Where shall I go?' She responded with naive serenity, "'If you have no choice, you might try a clothing store.' A certain foreign consul's lady was the acknowledged leader of fashion, and every time she appeared in anything new or extraordinary the ladies in the vicinity made a raid on their husbands' purses and arrayed themselves similarly. One man, who had suffered considerably and growled accordingly, was standing at the window when the shocks came, and the next instant the consul's wife, just out of the bath, fled by with no other apology for clothing than a bath-towel. The sufferer rose superior to the terrors of the earthquake, and said to his wife, "'Now that is something like. Get out your towel, my dear.' The plastering that fell from ceilings in San Francisco that day would have covered several acres of ground. For some days afterward groups of eyeing and pointing men stood about many a building, looking at long zigzag cracks that extended from the eaves to the ground. Four feet of the tops of three chimneys on one house were broken square off and turned around in such a way as to completely stop the draft. A crack a hundred feet long gaped open six inches wide in the middle of one street, and then shut together again with such force as to ridge up the meeting earth like a slender grave. A lady, sitting in her rocking and quaking parlor, saw the wall part at the ceiling, open and shut twice, like a mouth, and then drop the end of a brick on the floor like a tooth. She was a woman easily disgusted with foolishness, and she arose and went out of there. One lady who was coming downstairs was astonished to see a bronze Hercules 
lean forward on its pedestal as if to strike her with its club. They both reached the bottom of the flight at the same time, the woman insensible from the fright. Her child, born some little time afterward, was club-footed. However, on second thought, if the reader sees any coincidence in this, he must do it at his own risk. The first shock brought down two or three huge organ-pipes in one of the churches. The minister, with uplifted hands, was just closing the services. He glanced up, hesitated, and said, "'However, we will omit the benediction,' and the next instant there was a vacancy in the atmosphere where he had stood. After the first shock, an Oakland minister said, "'Keep your seats. There is no better place to die than this,' and added, after the third, uh, "'But outside is good enough,' and then he skipped out the back door." Such another destruction of mantel ornaments and toilet bottles as the earthquake created San Francisco never saw before. There was hardly a girl or a matron in the city but suffered losses of this kind. Suspended pictures were thrown down, but oftener still, by a curious freak of the earthquake's humor, they were whirled completely around with their faces to the wall. There was great difference of opinion at first as to the course or direction the earthquake traveled but water that splashed out of various tanks and buckets settled that. Thousands of people were made so seasick by the rolling and pitching of floors and streets that they were weak and bedridden for hours, and some few for even days afterward. Hardly an individual escaped nausea entirely. The queer earthquake— <clears throat> Episodes that formed the staple of San Francisco gossip for the next week would fill a much larger book than this, and so I will diverge from the subject. By and by, in the due course of things, I picked up a copy of the Enterprise one day, and fell under this cruel blow. Nevada Mines in New York. G. M. Marshall, Sheba Hoors, and Amos H. Rose, who left San Francisco last July for New York City with ores from mines in Pinewood District, Humboldt County, and on the Reese River Range, have disposed of a mine containing six thousand feet and called the Pine Mountains Consolidated, for the sum of three million dollars. The stamps on the deed, which is now on its way to Humboldt County from New York for record, amounted to three thousand dollars, which is said to be the largest amount of stamps ever placed on one document. A working capital of one million dollars has been paid into the Treasury, and machinery has already been purchased for a large quartz mill, which will be put up as soon as possible. The stock in this company is all full paid and entirely unaccessible. The ores of the mines in this district somewhat resemble those of the Sheba mine in Humboldt. Sheba Hurst, the discoverer of the mines, with his friends, corralled all the best leads and all the land and timber they desired before making public their whereabouts. Ores from there, assayed in this city, showed them to be exceedingly rich in silver and gold, silver predominating. There is an abundance of wood and water in the district. We are glad to know that New York Capital has been enlisted in the development of the mines of this region. Having seen the ores and assays, we are satisfied that the mines of the district are very valuable, anything but wildcat. Once more, native imbecility had carried the day, and I had lost a million. It was the blind lead over again. Let us not dwell on this miserable matter. If I were inventing these things, I could be wonderfully humorous over them, but they are too true to be talked of with hearty levity, even at this distant day. True, and yet not exactly as given in the above figures, possibly. I saw Marshall months afterward, and although he had plenty of money, he did not claim to have captured an entire million. In fact, I gathered that he had not then received fifty thousand dollars. Beyond that figure his fortune appeared to consist of uncertain vast expectations, rather than prodigious certainties. However, when the above item appeared in print, I put full faith in it, and incontinently wilted and went to seed under it. Suffice it that I so lost heart, and so yielded myself up to repinings and sighings and foolish regrets, that I neglected my duties and became about worthless as a reporter for a brisk newspaper. And at last one of the proprietors took me aside, with a charity I still remember with considerable respect, and gave me an opportunity to resign my berth, and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal. End of chapter 58